in the last couple of weeks, the latest census results were released in Australia. And one of the new stats that received a lot of attention in the media was the fact that the amount of people who ticked no religion increased sharply again. For the first time in Australian census history, those who ticked the Christian box numbered below 50%, and those who ticked no religion increased from 30 to 39%. And all the headlines came out. I was reading them while I was in lockdown. Abandoning God. Australians choose to live without God. Churches empty as Australians spurn religion. The ABC in particular was quite enjoying the opportunity to dance on the supposed grave of God. But I must say myself personally, I was not surprised, nor was I saddened when I was reading the news. Now don't get me wrong, please do not mistake me. I am saddened by the fact that so many of our fellow Australians choose to live with no regard for their creator and by extension live with no regard for eternal life. I am deeply saddened by that. But I was not saddened reading those stats in the news as if it was like 10% of the Australian population walked out of church in the last five years. What it's actually like is that 10% of Australians who walked out of church a long time ago stopped calling themselves Christians. They had turned their back on God a long time ago. So in one sense, all the media hysteria and the new reports, there was nothing really new to see here. A faithful, fruitful Christian needs to be called a Christian, but also needs to live as a Christian. Both of them together. And so is it really that big of a deal if someone who was merely called a Christian but wasn't a living one is no longer called one? Perhaps it's even an advantage that that now happens, that we actually have an honest look at the state of play at the moment. To, today we have one of Jesus' most famous parables and most rich parables the parable of the Good Samaritan. And one of the many lessons we can draw from this teaching from Jesus is the necessary connection between saying and doing. The necessary connection between talking and acting. Between being named as part of God's people and living as part of God's people. The priest and the Levite in the parable were certainly known as children of God. They would have also known a lot about being children of God. Experts, officials, professionals in their religion. If on that night that that poor man was robbed and beaten and the priest and the Levite were rushing home to finish their census, they would have certainly been two people who ticked the religion box. But for whatever reason unknown to us, there was something holding them back from living it. They both passed the man by. For whatever motivation, concern, distraction unknown to us, they failed to act in love. And perhaps it's better we don't know exactly why they chose not to act that evening. Because we can insert whatever struggle we go through into the story 
We can insert any struggle that makes us, makes it difficult for us to live being a Christian into the story. But the lawyer points out, and Jesus confirms, it's the Samaritan, the one when all the talking and postulating is done, the one when the committee has finished talking and the meeting has ended and the council has closed. It's the Samaritan, when all that is done, who actually commits and acts and does who proves himself to be the neighbor and hence proves himself to be worthy of eternal life. When the lawyer asks Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he gives the answer. Jesus says to him, do this and life is yours. Not talk about this and life is yours. Not think about this and life is yours. Do this and life is yours. At the end of the parable, the, the lawyer points out that the Samaritan is the one who is the neighbor. And Jesus says, go and do the same yourself. It's the one who acts. The parable and the census serve as spiritual warnings to us. They give us the warning that faith that is merely nominal, faith that is merely in name, is unfruitful and ultimately shrivels and dies. The parable and the census results warn us that wholeheartedly choosing God requires wholeheartedly living and acting for him. And it's this sort of faith by which we enter eternal life. Moses says to the people in the Old Testament and to us in the first reading, he says, obey the voice of the Lord. Because what this voice asks us to do, he says, is not beyond your strength or beyond your reach. Sometimes we can be sucked into the temptation that God's will for us, that the teachings of Christ and his church are mysterious, that what God actually wants us to do is unclear and unknown. It's a matter that isn't settled. Sometimes we can be sucked into the temptation of always asking, what does God want me to do? What does God want me to do? What does God want me to do? When it's already very clear, he's already said to us what he wants us to do. Or sometimes we can think God's will for us and obeying the voice of Christ in the church and living its teachings are humanly impossible. That God's will and the teachings of the gospel in the church, they're just abstract ideals. You can strive for them, but you can never actually live them. No one actually can do that. So we just aim for the ideal, and they don't become real. But Moses says no to both of these temptations. He rejects both of them. He says, it's not beyond your strength, or beyond your reach. In other words, it's not beyond our ability or our knowledge. He says, no, the word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart for your observance, for your doing. Living the love that opens us to eternal life Living that love that Christ speaks to, to us about in the gospel today is difficult, but it's not impossible. The ancient church fathers show us a way that we are able to live this love. And it's by their different reading of the parable of the Good Samaritan. The ancient church fathers of our faith 
Get us not so much to imagine ourselves as the Samaritan doing the loving, but to spend a bit of time imagining ourselves as the man who has been robbed, bashed and left half dead. They point out each of us, all of us, have taken the road from Jerusalem, God's city, down to Jericho, the city of sin. Each of us has walked that road. And this journey hasn't turned out well for any of us. It's left us all half dead. Our humanity is not firing on all cylinders. There's something of the fullness of life that is missing in us because of this journey of sin. And the helps of the old covenant and the helps of the world, the priest and the Levite are unable to pull us out of that ditch, to bring us back to the fullness of life. But the good Samaritan, Jesus, is the one who is able to and chooses to. He is moved to compassion to see us in our state. He bandages our wounds. He pours oil and wine on our wounds through the sacraments, the oil of baptism, the oil of confirmation, the oil of anointing of the sick. He pours the wine of his blood on our wounds in Holy Communion. He carries us into the inn that is his church with its safety and its truth. And he pays for us. He buys us back with his blood on the cross. And not only that, he signs a blank check. We hear the Samaritan says, just take care of him. I'll come back tomorrow and pay whatever I have to. Jesus treats us with the same generosity. He writes us a blank check of grace. Giving us anything we need. Once we let Jesus love us like this, how can we not go and do the same ourselves?